I'm Dr. Christina Kenny. I'm a professor at the University of California at Irvine. Today I'm going to talk to you about the background of age-related macular degeneration and some risk factors of the disease. Age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, is the most common cause of vision loss for people over 60 years of age in developed countries. And the incidence of AMD will increase with the aging population. The prevalence and cost of AMD are really amazing. In the United States, 11 million people have some form of AMD, and it's estimated that by 2050, 22 million people will have it. Worldwide, in 2020, it's estimated there's 96 million people with AMD, and by 2040, 288 million will have some form of AMD. As of 2016, in the United States alone, $512 billion was spent to provide care for AMD patients. So what is AMD? It's age-related macular degeneration. And what is a macula? A macula is a tiny part of the retina. It's 0.6 inches across, which is about 1.5 millimeters. In the center part of the macula is a region called the fovea centralis. And it's a very, very important area of the retina because it has a lot of cone photoreceptors. Now these are very, very specialized cells that allow you to see detail and color. In the periphery of the retina, that's where you have your rods. They allow you to see at night. That's your night vision but it's the cones in the center of the macula that allow you to read and see fine detail. The other thing that's very important about the macula is it has very specialized pigments that are actually present inside the cones. And these are called lutein and zeaxanthine. And I will be mentioning these later because as we get older, we lose these macular pigments. And these macular pigments are actually protective for the cones. As I mentioned before, the macula provides our 20-20 vision. It allows us to see fine details, to read, to drive, and recognize faces. And that's why the health of the macula is critical for good vision. In this slide is a cross-section of the anatomy of the eye. Over to the left, you can see the area that's called the cornea. That is the clear window part of the eye. The white part of the eye is called the sclera. All the light passes through the lens and it then focuses on the back of the eye and the area of the retina. Now the main place where it focuses on the macula and you can see by this image on the right how small the area of the macula is. This slide shows what is called a fundus photo of the retina. When you go to your eye doctor, they put eye drops in your eyes they dilate the pupil. And this is the image that they see when they look inside your eye. The first thing they see is the optic nerve. Then, lateral to that, they see area of the uh, retina called the macula, and that's where your uh, cones are located. When you look on the upper right part of this slide, it's just a schematic of how complicated and complex the retina is. There are literally dozens and dozens in, of cell, different cell types that comprise the retina. And when the light comes in, it passes through all of those uh, cells and it causes a chemical reaction, which is then transferred into an electrical reaction that is taken back to the brain. As you can see in the lower right are some schematics of the rods which are found, uh, they're the specialized cells that are found in the periphery of the retina and that allow us to have night vision, and the cones, which are found in the macular area that allow us the fine detail and the color. And it's these cones that are so critical to our vision. Now, with AMD, there are different forms. There's what's called the dry form, or atrophic AMD, and then there's the wet form, and the reason they call it the wet form is because it has abnormal blood vessels. That's called neovascular AMD. Now, 
85 to 90 percent of all cases are the dry form. And unfortunately, we don't have any treatments for the dry form. The wet form, which is the more rapid form of uh, causes vision loss more rapidly, only accounts for 10 to 15 percent of all the cases. But fortunately, we have a treatment which is an intravitreal injection of some anti-VEGF medications. And I will be talking to you in more detail about these medications. This slide shows uh, examples of what is called mild dry AMD. The image on the right is the fundus photo. Again, it's when somebody has gone in, the doctor has dilated the eye, and now this is what they're looking at when they look in the eye. And you can see over to the right is where the optic nerve is. And then in the center where there's the macula, you can see instead of being a beautiful orangish color, you can see these little mottled spots, white spots. Those are called drusen, and they're actually underneath the retina. Now the images on the left are a cross-section of the retina. And when you look at the retina, they're the cells that make up the neural part of the retina. And then below that, you have a single layer of retinal pigment epithelial cells, which are shown here as purple cells. And underneath that is a vascular bed called the choroidal vessels. Normally, the RPE cells sit right on top of the choroidal vessels, and they're in tight connection with each other. But here you can see in this diagram, there are deposits of this whitish protein lipid material that are called the drusen. And so that's what you're seeing underneath the retina. People that have early AMD will have these deposits underneath the retina. Now it doesn't mean that these deposits are going to cause real change in vision because you can have the deposits and it may not be affecting your vision. But the material that the drusen are made of can be actually quite toxic to the retinal cells. And that is the problem. In this next slide is an example of severe dry AMD, which we refer to as stage four AMD. And again, when you look at the image, uh, to the left, uh, you can see the optic nerve. And then you can see this large area where all of the retina has been uh, eliminated. So if that's the area where you have your macula and your, the area of the, where you have your good vision, you can see that this person would have peripheral vision, but they wouldn't have any central vision because the drusen and the materials that have collected underneath the retina have become so toxic that they start damaging the cells and they start dying. And so there's extensive what we call atrophy. This next slide shows examples of what we call wet AMD, and this is called stage five. As I mentioned before, the reason we call it wet is because there's abnormal blood vessels that are actually growing underneath the retina. So you can see on the image here on the left, again, here the, the top part here, that's where the retina is. Here are the retinal pigment epithelial cells, they're purple in color. And below that are the choroidal vessels. Well, what happens with wet AMD is those choroidal vessels, they start sprouting up abnormal, unhealthy new blood vessels. And they start moving their way through and they actually leak and grow underneath the retina. So when the doctor looks at the retina, as you would see here on the image on the right, instead of seeing that nice orangish uh, color that a healthy retina has, all of a sudden, they're deep beneath the retina, there's actually accumulation of blood clots. And that's what happens with wet AMD. And you can see how that would interfere with the vision. Because all of a sudden, they, you have the breaking of the cells, you have disruption of the photoreceptors and the cones, and the vision falls. The visual consequence of having AMD is that you lose your central vision. The image on the left is what a person with AMD would see when they look at a clock. Because it affects the macula, and that's your central vision, then you can have a blind spot 
or a scotoma right in the middle. And the, the image on the right is what a person would see when they look at their grandchild or their, their another uh, person. You would see the periphery, but you don't see the detail in the middle. And that's why people with AMD, they don't go completely blind and that they, and that they see uh, nothing. They will ha always have their peripheral vision, but they lose their central vision. And with loss of central vision, you lose your ability to read, to drive, and you really lose your independence. Now, fortunately, there are treatments for the wet form of AMD. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit of biology. So, normally we don't have these abnormal blood vessels. What stimulates these abnormal blood vessels to grow? And it's called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. Normally we have a little bit around, that, but it's all in a balance. What happens with AMD underneath the retina, we get a large amount of this VEGF. And all of a sudden, it stimulates all these abnormal blood vessels to grow. But these are not normal blood vessels, and they leak. And that's what happens with wet AMD. But over the last 10 to 15 years, we've developed drugs that can actually block the VEGF. If any of you have AMD and you've been to see your doctor and you're receiving these medications, some of these will be very familiar to you. These drugs are called anti-VEGF drugs. One of them is called Avastin. One of them is called Lucentis. And the third is called Ilea. But they all achieve the same goal, to block the VEGF so it will not stimulate abnormal blood vessel growth. The disadvantage of this is that once a person is treated, they have to be treated on a regular basis every four to six weeks because the VEGF will come back. This slide just summarizes the treatments for wet AMD. We do have the injections, and as you can see on this little image on the right, the injections are actually given into the vitreous. Uh, on a, it's not painful. And uh, it's a, actually a very, very safe procedure. But unfortunately, these patients do need to be treated on a regular basis so that they can keep the abnormal blood vessels under control. Now what I'd like to do is talk about risk factors. There are actually two categories of risk factors. The non-modifiable risk factors, the things we cannot control, how old we are, family history, genetics, gender, and race. But then there are modifiable risk factors that we can control. Smoking, obesity, eating habits, and exercise patterns. In terms of the non-modifiable risk factors, age is a major risk factor. All studies show that you have increased incidence of AMD with age. For people between the ages of 65 and 74 years, 10 to 20 percent of people have some form of AMD. Now it could be a very mild form, but which would mean that they would have the drusen, but they at least have some form. But that increases significantly because by the time you're 75 to 85, that number goes up from to 30 to 40 percent of people have some form. There is a fourfold higher risk of AMD in patients with a positive family history. So that is evidence that genetics does play a role in this disease. Women aged 75 years or older had two times the incidence of early AMD than men and four times the incidence of it for advanced AMD. And these numbers were found in multiple large studies that really looked at thousands and thousands of individuals. Interestingly, Race and ethnicity are also risk factors. For early AMD, they have similar rates in Caucasians and Hispanics and lower rates in African Americans. But by the time you look at late AMD, Caucasians are 6.7 times more likely to develop AMD than African Americans. 
That summarizes the non-modifiable risks. Those are things we can't do anything about. We can't make ourselves younger, we can't change our, our genetic history, but there, let's talk about the modifiable risks because these are things that are very, very critical and we can do something about. The number one modifiable risk for developing AMD is smoking. There have been over 13 studies that all show that smoking increases the risk of AMD. Smoking increases the likelihood of developing wet AMD. It increases the likelihood of recurrence of wet AMD and also developing dry AMD. There was a very large study called the Nurses Health Study. And in this study, they looked at thousands of people over a long period of time. And they found people that were currently smoking had 2.4 times more likelihood of having AMD. And if they were past smokers, they still had a two times risk for developing AMD. But the risk declines if you quit smoking. So they have done the studies and found that 29% of AMD cases could be attributable to smoking. So the number one thing that anybody can do for yourself, for your parents, for your grandparents is to not smoke. Now how about obesity? They have also found that there, with increased body mass index, that's called BMI, that when you have increased body mass index, overall you have increased inflammation. There's a particular protein called the C-reactive protein. That protein is associated with inflammation and that increases if you have a higher BMI. Also, you have increased ratio of the LDL, that's also known as the bad cholesterol, to the HDL, which is the good cholesterol. And this represents increased oxidation that can be damaging to the proteins and to the lipids, the fats in the body. The other thing is, is that if you have increased body mass index, you have reduced antioxidants. Now these, anti what are antioxidants? The antioxidants are the enzymes that circulate through the body. And as you develop these free radicals or these harmful uh, elements in your body, these enzymes go to those free radicals and gobble them up and get rid of them. So those antioxidants are very helpful in the body, but if you have increased body mass index, they they, the levels are lower. So the other thing about obesity is remember at the very beginning of the talk, I was talking about macular pigments. Those macular pigments are also called keratinoids. What happens is that with increased adipose tissue, which is the fat that's in the body, they actually can become a sink or an attractant to those lutein and zeaxanthin molecules. So instead of being in the retina, being protective, they then become attached to the adipose tissue and that makes you more susceptible to getting AMD. So as you have increased body fat, you have decreased serum levels of these keratinoids. In 2009, uh, there was a large study and they looked at 261 individuals that had AMD. And they said, well, if obesity is a problem and smoking is a problem, how about if you do physical activity? How about if you walk more or you get out? They found that if you had vigorous physical activity three times a week, you could reduce the risk of AMD progression by 25% compared to those people that had no physical activity. Now the physical activity doesn't mean you have to go out and play tennis or, or um, skiing or anything like that. Just vigorous walking, getting up, getting out three times a week can really be helpful. Now what about diet? There have been a lot of studies about diet. And what they have found is there's something called omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are found in fish, especially high levels in, in fish such as salmon. 
they found that if you have a higher fish consumption, that it decreases the likelihood of developing the wet or neovascular AMD. So, with our patients, with, the, with your family, with yourself, what kind of lifestyle modifications can we recommend? Number one, do not smoke. It is the main modifiable risk factor for AMD. Number two, how do you improve your diet? You eat less red meats and high fat dairy products. Avoid saturated fats and eat fish two or three times per week. There are a lot of different kinds of fish that you can have and all of them help. And if you don't like to eat fish, you can take the high omega-3 fatty acid pills and nuts. You can eat any kind of nut because it is very good for protection. The other thing is, is eat green leafy vegetables. Because again, we're gonna go, go back and talk about the lutein and the zeaxanthin, those macular pigments that we need for protection. They're found in high quantities in the green leafy vegetables. Now, if you don't like to eat your vegetables, that's okay. You can use vitamin supplements that include the lutein and the zeaxanthin. And as I mentioned before, if you don't wanna eat fish, that's okay. You can take the omega-3 fatty acid supplements. And then finally, maintain a healthy weight. So this slide shows other agents that may be protective. The antioxidants, your vitamins, vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin A, your carotenoids, the ones we talked about, the lutein and the zeaxanthin. Now another carotenoid is called leucopene. Leucopene is found in high levels in tomatoes. So when you make a salad, add the tomatoes to get your leucopene. And there are flavonoids, which are green teas, your bilberry, your grape seeds. And there's others, such as the still beans, that have the resveratrol. Also red wines and grapes, blueberries, peanut butters, and of course, dark chocolate. Now, you might say, well, what green leafy vegetables would be really useful? And this slide gives you an idea of how many milligrams of lutein and zeaxanthin there are in a 100 gram wet weight of the vegetable. So here, for example, is kale. If it's cooked, there's over 15,000 milligrams. So kale is jam-packed with lutein and zeaxanthin. As opposed to green peas, if they're cooked, they have 1,350 milligrams per 100 kilograms. So you, knowing these numbers, you can decide what is a really beneficial type of vegetable to incorporate in your diet. So what are some of the foods with carotenoids? So we talked about lutein. Egg yolks have a lot of lutein. Kiwi fruit, grapes, spinach, pumpkin. What about zeaxanthin? Again, egg yolks, orange juice, oranges and mangoes, and of course the leucopene, the tomatoes. So basically you see a pattern here. Vegetables and food with color that are red in color, orange in color, they, they are some of those that have the carotenoids. And finally, foods with vitamin C and bioflavonoids. Those are grape seeds, cranberries, and bilberry because they strengthen the retina and choroidal capillaries in the body. There's one thing I do want to mention, and these are safety tips, because you do need to keep in mind that while a little bit of these supplements is really, really good, too much of it can be harmful. For example, there's increased risk of lung cancer in smokers with high intakes of beta carotene, which is the same as vitamin A. So you want to take some vitamin A, but not very high risk. You have to stay in the safe dosages, which for non-smokers is 15 milligrams. Also, high levels of vitamin E supplements can increase the risk of heart failure. So a safe dose is 400 international units of vitamin E.
People with heart conditions and blood thinners should tell their doctors about the vitamins they're taking. Because for example, spinach and leafy greens contain high amounts of vitamin K, which can interact with blood thinners. Now let's say you really don't want to eat all those vegetables and, and have salads every day. You can also get these nutritions through over-the-counter supplements. In all the pharmacies, there's a whole section that will have the supplements that focus on the eye and high health. And this slide just shows the different vitamins, the different supplements, and the dosages that are usually present in those over-the-counter supplements. Hopefully, I have provided information that has been helpful about the background of AMD, some of the risk factors for AMD, and how you can get control over the modifiable risk factors. If you would like more information on the topic, please visit our website at www.discoveryi.org, or you can go to www.nei.org nih.gov. I hope that you have found the information in this video helpful. This was supported by Discovery Eye Foundation, which is a nonprofit 501c3 organization dedicated to finding treatments and cures for sight saving eye diseases. If you'd like more information, please visit our website at www discoveryi.org. Thank you very much. Discovery I Foundation, investing in new ideas for a brighter future.